Amen. Is God your desire this morning? Amen. What do you want to get from God? And uh, I believe that as Christians, if you desire to know God, then God will let you know Him. Amen. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. But if you came this morning and your desire is not to know God, then you'll get what you asked for. Amen. But if you've come to know God this morning, I believe that we can find something from the Word of God that can help us. But as we desire to know God, we have to put God first. Amen. For our families, for our children, for ourselves. Amen. Put God first in your life. Amen. And let God do a work. Well, we're going to open our Bibles. Luke chapter 17, verse number 17. Luke chapter 17, verse number 17. We're going to read just one verse. Luke 17, verse 17. And let's all stand in honor of the Word of God. Luke 17, verse number 17. We're going to read this all together out loud. Amen. That's in the Old Testament. No, I'm just kidding. The New Testament. Amen. One of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke 17, verse number 17. We're going to read together. Ready? Begin. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Amen. I'm going to preach you a message this morning. God laid on my heart. Where are the nine? Where are the nine? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. God, thank you for a wonderful day that you've given to us. Lord, I'm excited about the message this morning. Lord, I believe that you're going to do a work. Lord, I know you did a work in my heart. I pray that, Lord, as God's people, Lord, uh, listen. May you open up their hearts, open up their minds to understand the Word of God. Lord, and just would you speak to us in a special way. Lord, I know that it's raining, and Lord, sometimes the rain, Lord, makes us dreary. Lord, I know it did me this morning. Lord, I pray that you would grab our attention as only you can do through the Holy Spirit of God and use us this morning in a special and a mighty way. Lord, we love you so much. Can't thank you enough, God. I ask that you'd bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. In our story here, Jesus is coming from, coming to, going to Jerusalem. He's getting ready to be crucified, and he knows that his hour has come. Amen. We all know how that Jesus Christ came and died for us and gave his life. Amen. But while he's on the way, if you looked up there in uh, verse number 12, well, verse 11, we'll start there, and it says, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. So he's on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus is traveling, traveling with the disciples. Amen. And they didn't have a, uh, you know, a car or uh, maybe, I don't know if they went by camel or what they did here, amen. But Jesus was traveling. And as he's going, it says, as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers. So we have ten men that come and find Jesus as he's traveling along. They've heard about Jesus. They've known his miracles. They've known that he's cleansed other lepers and that how he's made the blind to see. And so excitedly, they come to Jesus as he's on his way. But notice they, it says here that they stood afar off. You understand, leprosy in that day was very contagious. Leprosy was very common. They had leper villages where those that were lepers would stay and have to live together to try to isolate the spread of the disease. Leprosy is something that affects you from the inside out. If you've ever known, it's not as common today, but it still, it still comes about. Uh, but it comes from, the, it eats you from the inside out. It will slowly, uh, if you see many lepers, they begin to lose all of their uh, extremities, their fingers, their toes, parts of their faces, and things will just, just, just fall off for no reason because leprosy just eats you from the inside out. And so it says that they stood afar off. Their leprosy, had, they, they couldn't get as close to Jesus. They had to stay farther away because of the disease that they had. But they stood afar off, and it says, and they lifted up their voices. I'm not sure how far away they stood. I know that they took very careful and precaution. So you can imagine they were a pretty well good a ways from Jesus, and they cried as loud as they can, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And ten men lifting up their voices all cried at the same time. I, believe, I don't know as much about these ten men, but I believe that these were uh, different men. Men that maybe some of them were single. Some of them may have had families. Some of these men may have uh, been very young. Some may be very old. We don't know much about these ten men, but we can imagine that maybe they all 
had some kind of family, moms and dads or wife and children, brothers and sisters, that they had not been a part of for so long because of a disease. Imagine for themselves they wanted to be cleansed so that way they could be able to be around family. Can you imagine having a wife and children and then having to leave and never see them hardly ever again because of a disease. Could you imagine having a mom and a dad and never be getting to be able to hug them again or kiss them on the cheek because of your disease? Amen. They had that disease, leprosy, once you had it, they pretty much pronounced you dead. You were, you were pretty much dead to them, dead to your family because you really could never do anything ever again. You had to stay in a certain place. They were confined. They weren't allowed to venture out where other people could go. Leprosy was like a prison for these people. So when Jesus saw them, it says, verse 14, And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. It says, And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Boy, what a blessing. Can you imagine that you come to Jesus and say, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And Jesus doesn't even go near them. Jesus doesn't even give them any hope. He just says, go show yourselves unto the priests. So these men in faith, in faith, because remember, Jesus did not heal other lepers the same way. Jesus did not heal the other people the same way. Jesus said to them, go show yourselves unto the priests. They had to put their faith that Jesus knew what he was doing. And so it says they turned around and they went. But as they went, they were cleansed. I want you to imagine in your mind as they're walking or put yourself maybe in their shoes. They're all ten men side by side, lepers, going to show themselves to the priests. One man is walking and all of a sudden looks down. Hey, fellas. Fellas. Look. Look. I'm healed. And all ten men slowly begin to realize leprosy's gone. With that, the hope of knowing that now they can go home. Now they can see their family. Now they can go hug their wife. Now they can kiss. Now they can grab their child and hug them around the neck and say, I'm home. They can go find mom and dad and say, Mom, Dad, look, I'm clean. Maybe one man was a teenager. He'd been away from mom and dad since a little boy, maybe. He can go home to mom and dad and say, Mom, Dad, look, I'm clean. His ten men begin to slowly realize it and begin to run down the road and begin to go back home. It says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. Imagine one man running down the road, stopping. He said, You know what? It's a miracle, but it's because of Jesus. So he goes back to Jesus and it says in verse 16, He fell down on his face. And at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. You know, he was somebody that he knew really didn't, he really wasn't anything in the eyes of the world. He really was a nobody. And he was thankful that Jesus took time for a nobody to make him clean. You know, I'm a nobody. I'm not much in the eyes of this world. I feel like this Samaritan. Literally, because my grandma's a Jew and my dad's a Gentile, that makes me Samaritan. <laughs> and I feel this guy's paid, no. But I feel spiritually like the Samaritan. How thankful I am Jesus took time for me. And one man turned around and gave thanks. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. He, Jesus looks up and sees one man and says, where are the others? He says, there's only one to give glory to God, save this stranger. Verse 19, he, and he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. I believe Jesus said that to point out to us to understand it wasn't the work of going to the priest that cleansed them, but it was their faith trusting God that made them whole. You know, in church work, 
And this is where we're going to draw the message from. When working in a church, when you come to church, you see people come and you see people leave. And you know, like Jesus, sometimes we ask, where'd they go? One comes back, but where are the others? I believe the answer to this is at the very beginning of verse 17 when Jesus said, were there not ten cleansed? You know, I don't know where the other nine went, but I know they were cleansed. I believe the emphasis in this portion of Scripture is not the one that came back and gave thanks, but that the miracle that all ten were cleansed. You know, when you come to church long enough, some of you have been here since this church just about began. You can look around at all the pews and say, I wonder where everybody went. You know, I'm not sure, but I sure am glad they're cleansed. You know, somebody came and got saved and got baptized. Where are they? I'm not sure, but I know they're cleansed. You know, the emphasis at our church is not about on how many sit in the pews. Although I want you to be here, and I believe it's a command of God to be in church, but the emphasis must not be on the growth of the church, but on those that are cleansed. You see, I cannot grow this church. I want you to understand me. I cannot grow the church and make people sit in those pews. I can't grow you. That's God's job. And you can't grow each other. You know what our job is? To go find the lepers and tell them they can be cleansed. Amen. Sometimes we get a little off focus and we think, well, man, only one came back. Must not be worth it. Can I tell you, though, there are ten people that are going to spend eternity in heaven. Can I tell you what the blessing is? Maybe not everybody turns around. Maybe not everybody gives glory to God. Maybe not everybody gets their life right with God. But praise God, somebody's going to be in heaven tonight. I'd rather have a hundred people die and spend eternity in heaven than the same hundred turn around and go to hell. I'd rather have the same hundred people get to die and go to heaven and never spend one minute in church than a hundred people die and go to hell because we thought, well, it must not be worth it. May I remind you, Jesus said, I will build my church. In a fundamental independent Baptist church, those doors are like revolving doors. People come, people leave. But you know what? My prayer is that they got the gospel. They got cleansed. Now, should they grow? Sure. Should they be in church? Sure. But we can't control that. You know what we can control? whether or not they're cleansed. We can give them the gospel. Amen this morning. What's the emphasis on our church? Getting the lepers. Amen. Giving the gospel. What should we do? We should be constantly soul winning, spending time out on the streets. That's why we go sometimes to the inner city where maybe the poor are or maybe people that can't profit the church. We don't go to the rich. We don't go always just to one segment of society. We go to everybody. And maybe not everybody will come but they can be cleansed. Amen. That's the blessing. Sometimes people question the motives of an independent Baptist church that goes out with buses and reaches into the highways and the hedges. And I've had people call and say, how come you bring the boys and girls to church? They'll never be able to do anything for the church, but they can be cleansed this morning. I've worked on a bus and brought little boys and girls and brought the crippled and brought the lame and brought the dumb. And you know what? They've never given one dime. But they were cleansed. What a joy. I would say, for a church that calls and, and questions and says, how come you spend time reaching those that are unprofitable? And I ask the same church, when's the last time you saw somebody saved? Maybe somebody says, how come our church, we go, go so and give the gospel those people never come. But you know what? They'll spend eternity in heaven with you. Amen. That's the blessing. I don't know where they are. 
but they're cleansed. Boy, that's the best part. Let me ask you a question. If you died today, are you 100% sure that you'd go to heaven? If you are, be thankful. Amen. If you are, then praise God. Would you rather spend eternity in heaven or spend eternity in hell? I believe everybody else would make the same decision. They would rather spend eternity in heaven, spend eternity in hell. They may not be what we think they ought to be, but they'll be in heaven. Let me give you some thoughts real quick from this portion of Scripture. I believe that we can learn a couple things. These are just some thoughts. They're not quite the main points, but some things I noticed that I want you to see and understand. Verse 12, it says, And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. Sin will cause you to be far from God. Because of their leprosy, because of their disease, they couldn't even come near Jesus. They couldn't even get close to Him. You know why we reach people with the gospel? Because if they're living their sin, it doesn't matter what they do or where they go. They'll never get even close to Jesus. If you're in your sin this morning, you have to stand afar from God because your sin is like a disease that keeps you away from God. When the blood of Christ is cov covers your sin and is, applied to, and is applied to your life, God sees no longer your sin, but your sin's paid for. God sees the blood of Jesus, and it allows fellowship. If you're not saved this morning, if you're not born again, you don't know a time when you accepted Jesus and you called out for mercy from the Master, then your sin keeps you far from God. These people may never come to church, but now they have an opportunity to know God. Now they have an opportunity to get close to Jesus. Lost people are far from God. They wonder, they think, why is there a barrier? How come I don't see God move? It's because of sin. Sin is like that disease of leprosy that confines you. It keeps you in a box. People think, well, if I, freedom is being able to do whatever I want. Well, you go off and go into sin and watch how much more sin will bind you and how sin will put fetters on your hands and feet. Amen. Sin keeps you far from God. Sin keeps you far from God as a lost person, but as a Christian, sin can keep you far from God. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You as a Christian may be cleansed and God can have fellowship, but when you constantly allow sin and iniquity to fill your soul, fill your life, then God has to take a few steps away and there's fellowship, but God says you've got to get that right. You're my son, but you're dirty. It's kind of like if I came to your house and came to visit and I tracked in through the mud and opened the door and said, Hello! <laughs> You'd be like, throw the preacher out you know why I'm dirty you know we have fellowship with God but we like to come to God's throne and, and trek in sin all throughout our day and then say hey God and God says no 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 you got to clean up a little bit here as a Christian you can be far from God pride can keep you from God, even as a Christian. It won't keep you from heaven as a lost person, but it'll keep you from fellowship with your Savior. Sin will keep you far from God. Thought number two. Notice, only Jesus can cleanse the leper. Notice they came to Jesus. Amen. Jesus was their only hope. Why do we take the gospel to all the lost and the dying? Because Jesus is the only hope. Amen. These lepers couldn't go to the church. They didn't go to the house of God. They didn't go to the synagogue. They went to Jesus. You know, some people won't be, always be able to go to church. Some people are stuck in nursing homes. Some people are stuck in the prisons. Some people are stuck where they'll never spend one moment in the house of God. But Jesus can go to them. Jesus can cleanse the sinner. Amen. But only Jesus can. Notice only Jesus spoke. The disciples were with him. But the disciples held their tongue. Because only Jesus can pronounce a sinner clean. You have leprosy this morning. You're a sinner. And sin is eating you from the inside out. And you don't even know it. Only Jesus can cleanse you this morning. Their faith in Jesus is what made them whole. 
Their faith enough to ask Jesus for mercy. Only Jesus can cleanse that sinner. Only Jesus can cleanse the saved. If you say this morning, you've been maybe as a Christian away from God. Your sin is kind of keeping you from fellowship. Then you need to go to Jesus this morning. You need to get on your knees and go to Jesus. Ask Jesus to forgive you. Say, Jesus, I know I'm saved, but I've been in sin. I need to get it right. Amen. Only Jesus can do it. Sometimes as Christians we think, well, if I go to church, I can get back close to God. Nothing will ever take the place of a personal prayer time getting things right with God. It says, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Don't confess your sin to me. I can't help you. I got my own sin to worry about. Don't confess your sin to some other man. He can't help you. There's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. The other thought is, the other nine were still cleansed, even though they didn't turn around and thank God. Remember this this morning, you may have family members, and maybe they're away from God. Maybe they didn't turn around and do what you think they ought to do, but they're still cleansed this morning. Maybe they didn't uh, maybe quite turn out the way you thought it should. But they're still cleansed this morning. Amen. That's the blessing. Don't let anybody ever tell you that as a church, it's, not, it's in vain to go soul winning. Some people try to tell, uh, as a Baptist church, they try to say that, you know, you're going out week after week. My mic dropped. But I've had people tell me, I've had other churches tell me, that your work is in vain. I've had them tell me they don't really even get saved. I've had them tell me that. I've had them tell me that they don't even get saved because they can't just get saved in a few minutes. Well, then I take them to these ten lepers and say, you know, all they did was say a couple words, and in a few minutes they were cleansed. It's funny how that what it is, is we try to just make an excuse to not go so wet. What it is, is we try to make an excuse and say, well, they didn't come and turn out for God. That means they didn't really get it. I've had people tell me that. Hey, buddy, they were cleansed. And that's the blessing. But you know what this is? This is also a picture of eternal security. This is also a picture of how that you as a Christian are cleansed and you may not turn around and go back to God. But God doesn't take that promise away from you. Isn't that a blessing? God doesn't say, well, you didn't turn around and thank me. I guess I'll take it back. God didn't say, well, you didn't turn your life around. You weren't what I told you you ought to be. I guess I'm going to turn around and take it back. Amen. No, they were all still cleansed. Amen. Boy, I, I, I about shouted on that one. I was sitting there thinking, how about, amen, sometimes we know we fail. You ever done that? You go through a day and you go, man, God, I messed up. <laughs> but God doesn't take the promise of the Savior away. When God says you can be cleansed, God doesn't put a bylaw with it. God doesn't put a retraction. Amen. You're cleansed. Amen. Now, the points and we'll be done. What does this mean to the church? This means we are to reach everybody. All ten were reached. Maybe one only turned back. But everybody is to hear the gospel. Every leper can be cleansed. Whether they are poor, whether they are rich, whether they're clean, whether they're dirty, whether they're young, whether they're old. The gospel's to go to everywhere, to everybody to your workplace, to your neighbors, to everyone. They may not turn out for God. They may not come to church. They may not do all of those things. But they can be cleansed this morning. Better they spend eternity in heaven and never come to church and die and go to a devil's hell. But we want to make excuses for ourselves. Say, well, it didn't turn out for God. They can be cleansed this morning. It means to the church, the command is to reach everybody. It also means to the church... To not focus on turning people out for God. Jesus is who works on the heart. People come forward, get saved. 
I'll get them baptized, amen. It's the command. I'll baptize them. I'll preach God's word. But God grows his people, not I. My job as an independent Baptist preacher is to preach the gospel. Too often we're focused on building the church. Too often we're focused on building things. And I believe that we ought to try and we ought to uh, do, go and follow up and go and do all of those things. But the focus is preaching the gospel. Amen. Not everyone will surrender their lives. But that should not discourage us from giving the gospel. Not everyone will do what we think they should do. But don't be discouraged. Give the gospel. Keep going. Amen. As you as a Christian, you've probably given the gospel and watched people get saved time after time after time. And sometimes we get discouraged and think, well, where are they? Let me tell you where they are. They're cleansed today. They're going to heaven. We get discouraged and other churches look and they mock and they ridicule and they say, well, you know, your church isn't very big. Maybe you need to stop going so and spend more time on having the music program. Brother, I'll tell you, I'd rather have the worst music program and be the greatest soul winner in the world than have the greatest music program in all of America and never see one sinner walk an aisle. Some other will look at us and say, well, maybe you need to stop going soul winning. Spend more time on maybe the landscaping. <laughs> now, I believe we ought to. Brother Wes and I have some wonderful ideas. Beautiful ideas. And we're going to try to get it done because I believe everything ought to be done decently and in order. But if we spend more time focusing on that than on giving the gospel, then we've lost our focus. Some churches will tell you, maybe you need to spend more time on your presentation. Which I do. But I'd rather be the worst preacher in the world and have the power of God than to spend hours on a sermon building website. Amen. Maybe your people need to spend more time uh, uh, in, in advertising. And I'm all for advertising. But I'd rather have a church full of people that go soul winning than a church full of people that can put a sign on a billboard. Because you know, I've seen billboards all over town. And not one of those churches give the gospel. It's the gospel preaching church that Jesus will build. They can build the church their way, but at the end of the day, those people are going to die and spend eternity in hell. How sad. The next thought, or the next point. Those who do turn out will come from unexpected places. Those people that do turn out Sometimes we'll come from unexpected places. You notice he was a Samaritan. He wasn't rich, wealthy. He wasn't maybe even the preacher's kid. He was just the Samaritan. The lowest of the low. Amen. The reason we need to reach everybody is because you don't know who will turn around for God. Look at your life where you've come from, and where you are now. You never thought you'd be sitting in a church like this. It's because God's interested in everybody. Now, I believe that the preacher's kid can turn out. I believe that the rich can turn out. I believe anybody can turn out. But the reason you give the gospel everywhere is because you never know who will turn out. You never know who's going to turn around and do something great for God. Many great men of God came from the home of a drunkard. Many great men of God came off a bus route. Many great men of God came from a preacher's home in a small place where nobody knew. But God can use anybody. Don't stop giving the gospel to that little boy across the street. You never know what God will do. Don't stop giving the gospel to that person behind the counter. You never know what God will do. Don't stop giving the gospel to those that maybe don't look as appealing. You never know what God will do. Amen. What's your focus this today? Our focus as a church must be on preaching the gospel. 
reaching as many as we can, coming out on Saturday and going soul winning week after week or during the week or whenever you can go, handing out those tracts, giving the gospel. Because God says he'll build a church that has that focus. He won't be a part of a church that's more concerned with the music, that's more concerned with the presentation or the buildings and all of those things. But God will build the building. God will build the music. God will build the presentation. If God's people are focused on soul winning. You say, well, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. Then can I challenge you to go to every church in town and you find people that are being born again. I've been to them. I've seen it. Where the gospel's not preached. Where the lost are in their sin. How sad. People dying and going to hell. Because they're led astray. Because somebody's not preaching the gospel. Somebody's telling them they can be baptized to go to heaven. Somebody else is telling them that they can trust in their works to get them to heaven. Somebody else is telling them that there's another Jesus. There's another way. And it's up to us to preach. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, it was a blessing yesterday. I got to go to Brother Johnny's house and we spent some time talking. Boy, good fellowship. And you know, and his, his grandson Nick, 15, right? He's 15. He came out and I wanted to meet him. And I asked Brother John, I said, do you know if your grandson's born again? He said, you know, I don't know. So we asked him together, do you know if you died, you'd go to heaven? You know, he said, I don't know. He said, I'm having a, he said, I don't know if God's real. He says, I'm not really sure. And I got to take my Bible and open the Word of God and tell him about Jesus. You know, he went to a church in Oklahoma, didn't hear the gospel. How sad. You know, he's been to other churches. Finally, it took a preacher from Kansas to just give him the gospel. And you know what? He got saved. Amen. He believed in God, and he trusted Jesus for salvation. That's our job. You find me another church that does that in town, and I'll find you a church that'll keep God building them. But you find me a church that doesn't focus on preaching the gospel. And I'll find you a church that's dead. And the Bible says that they'll not last. Amen. I've seen them. Been a part of them. Not as a member, but I've seen them and been in them is what I mean. And if you as a Christian aren't focused on preaching the gospel, you'll never be what God wants you to be. God saved you this morning. God didn't save you to come work at this church. God didn't save you so you could stand behind a pulpit. God saved you so you could preach the gospel to somebody else. Now in that, He may have you stand behind a pulpit. He may have you come and work at a church. But everything you do is focused around giving the gospel. Last, last uh, story and we'll close. I got an email from a preacher friend of mine. When he was in high school, he was away from God, didn't get saved till he was older. When he was in high, in high school, he dated a young lady that is an all-star basketball player right now. She's in, her name is Laura May Switzer. She's in college basketball. And he dated her twice, two years in a row. Later, he joined the military, got saved, got into the house of God, and, got, and God led him to be a pastor. Years later, uh, somebody came and joined his church in Oklahoma. And they knew this lady that he had dated in high school. His wife had played basketball with her. And so they told the pastor, we know who that is. And the lady said, it was my friend. I played basketball with her. They got saved and then joined the church. And they would take Pastor Vineyard every year to Creed, Colorado for vacation. He said, every year we went. He said, and every year, I would take my wife shopping. I like how he did it. I need to start doing it. He'd take his wife shopping. He'd let her go to the store. He said, and he'd sit on the bench and read a book. <laughs> and as people would walk by, he'd said, here's a track. He said, it'll tell you how you can go to heaven. Please take this, read this before you go to bed tonight. 
He said and everybody would walk by. He'd give a track. Creed, Colorado. As he was doing that, he gave a track to an old cowboy. The cowboy took the track. He was born again, but he took the track. He died that week while, he, while Pastor Vineyard was in, on vacation. And they came in a hearse to Pastor Vineyard's house and said, the Baptist pastor's out of town. Will, will you do his funeral? He said, I sure will. So he stayed an extra day, did the funeral. While he was at the funeral, a man wanted to get saved but just wouldn't do it. So Brother Vineyard went down and talked to him and said, Sir, would you like to be born again? He said, No, but if you come to my house tonight, he said, I'll get saved. So Brother Vineyard said, We extended our vacation another day. He went to this man's house, led him to the Lord. The man's wife was born again. Her name was Mary. And she said, Brother Vineyard, I've been, he, she said, I've met you. And I got saved, and for years I've been praying that you'd come to my house and lead my husband to the Lord. She said, my husband came back from the funeral today and said, Honey, your preacher's here. He's coming tonight, and I'm going to get saved. God used somebody from way back in high school. He's not met. Brought some people that knew that person to Brother Vineyard. They took them, him and his wife to a spot he'd never been to for vacation for years to somebody that he'd never met whose wife was praying that he'd get saved. Because you know why? God wants people to be saved. And God wants to use you to reach people that you don't even know. You've never met. And they're begging for the gospel. They never went to church but they were cleansed. They never joined His church, but they were cleansed. Because God wants to use you as a tool to reach people. How's your soul winning been? Have you been given the gospel? Think about those co-workers. Maybe, you got, maybe they've been praying. Maybe they've been seeking God. Have you, God's put you in a place. Have you allowed God to use you? Amen. Now let's spend time. We work at the church. We keep the church moving. But let's give the gospel. Amen. I'm thankful for Brother Wes and some of those that were here and kept the church moving. Boy, I wouldn't have a church without faithful members. But God says if the church is to move even farther, we've got to give the gospel. You go soul winning. You give the gospel and you watch God build the church. A lot of empty spots. God can put them there. But he wants to know if God puts somebody there, will they get the gospel? If God puts somebody there, will they get the gospel? If God puts somebody beside you, would they get the gospel? If not, they can go to every other church in town and get the same thing. But here, I believe, they can get what they need and they can be cleansed. They may never come back, but they can get the gospel. That's the focus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you.